Hey everyone, it's Mr. Moan. I'm here with some tips for getting started on the phylogenetic analysis lab. The first step, as always, is to read through the guidelines. Uh, I would specifically encourage you to work through the simplified example that's embedded in the guidelines. This will allow you to get a feel for what this task involves overall. You're going to be using a couple different online tools to first look up DNA sequences for organisms that you want to compare, and then secondly to align and analyze those sequences. The second step would be to read through the student sample articles. I provided these because I think they give a really good example of what we call exemplars. They are examples of exceptional student work from previous school years, uh, and these are really given to give you a, a feel for what this assignment could be. Um, and I would encourage you to strive to produce work of similar quality. Of course, my expectation is that you will do your very best. The third step is to read the questions to help you get started, which are towards the end of the guidelines. This will give you the chance to contemplate this specific question that you want to focus on. I will be honest with you, the hardest part of this assignment is coming up with a good question. And it's important that the question that you do investigate is one that you have a specific interest in answering. That way you'll be motivated to find that answer. The fourth step is to look up the scientific names for the organisms that you're going to be comparing. Um, you do need to know those scientific names because when you search the database for the DNA sequences, you'll have to put in the scientific name, not the common name of the organism. Uh, once you have those names, you can enter those into the search bar on the website. I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. The other thing you need to be sure you remember is to include an appropriate outgroup. An outgroup in this case is like a standard of comparison. It's a specific species that you know is likely to be distantly related to the other organisms that you're comparing within your group. That way, when you run the analysis, if that outgroup is not the first organism to branch off from everything else, it tells you that you probably did something wrong, or at least the gene that you're using for this comparison is not a good representation of the relationship among those organisms. So the other day, for whatever reason, I started thinking about gophers. And then I remembered that there is another species that lives in Florida that's sometimes called the gopher. It's the gopher tortoise. And then I thought about, well, what would happen if you crossed the rodent gopher with the reptile gopher? And suddenly I realized you'd get an armadillo. And as I started doing more research on armadillos, I came to find out there's actually quite a few species of armadillos living all throughout South America and parts of North America. There's the nine-banded armadillo, the pink fairy armadillo. There's even one called the screaming hairy armadillo, which looks a little something like this. And so then I thought about the fact that there's another mammal that's covered in armor, the Chinese pangolin. And so finally, that led me to my question. Are the armor-covered mammals descended from the same common ancestor? So to start, we're going to go to the NCBI's nucleotide resource page. And we're going to do a little bit of research for an armadillo species. So let's start with the scientific name of an armadillo. Let's go with the giant armadillo. And over here, usually you'll find the scientific name listed right there. It is Preodontes maximus. Using that, I can now go to the NCBI website, put in that scientific name, and then using one of the barcoding genes. The one I'm going to use is called COX1, which is an abbreviation for cytochrome oxidase subunit 1. And then I'll go ahead and search for that. And what's going to pop up is likely a page that will be for that gene itself. Now if I click this link, you'll see lots of information about this gene in this particular species. What I'm interested in is the actual DNA sequence. And so I'm going to go to this link right here that says FASTA. Uh, basic rule of thumb is if you want to get your analysis done, click on the FASTA link because it will make your analysis go FASTA. So here it is. This is the DNA that I want to use in my analysis. I'm going to take it and copy it. And then I'm going to go to a file that I have opened in Microsoft Word, and I'm going to add that. And as you can see, I've actually already done that for three other species of armadillo. We've got our friend the Screaming Hairy Armadillo, the Greater Naked Tail Armadillo, the Pink Fairy Armadillo, and then I have already previously entered the information here for the Giant Armadillo. But let's go ahead and replace that with what I just copied and pasted. 
What you'll notice is that this first line needs to be updated so that it represents something that is actually meaningful to me. So I'm going to go ahead and remember that the software is going to read everything from this greater, sign, greater than symbol all the way through the first space as the label for that specific set of information. And so you can see for these others I've actually used underscores with the scientific name followed by the common name followed by the name of the gene that I'm analyzing. And so I need to do that here for the giant armadillo. Now I'm going to add some underscores. I can get rid of the rest of all, all of this line and put in the common name, giant armadillo. And then remember, I want to give the name of the gene. It was a cytochrome oxidase subunit 1 gene, or COX1. Now, to complete my analysis, I also have the Chinese pangolin cytochrome oxidase subunit 1. But what I also need is going to be, I'm going to need an outgroup for my comparison. And so a good outgroup in this case would be something that's not a mammal at all. And I thought, well, what better organism to use than one that we've actually encountered in our previous lab? We used the Drosophila melanogaster in our genetics lab. So here is the COX1 gene for Drosophila melanogaster. Now, again, I'm going to use this same gene page. Here it is, the fruit fly. And remember also, we can go to this link right here, the FASTA link, that will make our analysis go FASTA. Copy that information. And then we'll paste it right here into my file. Again, we have to change that first line to make sure that it has the right label. So using an underscore, I can label this the Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly. And then remind myself this is the COX1 gene for the fruit fly. Now the software will actually begin reading the DNA sequence on the next line. So now I've got my file. This is all of the information I'm going to need. You can see there's quite a bit of DNA here for the analysis. All I have to do now is select all and copy this information. And then I'm going to go to the Clustal Omega website. And on this website, there's one simple change I have to make before I run my analysis. I have to make sure that I tell the software that I'm going to be comparing DNA sequences, not protein sequences. And so from that drop-down menu, you select DNA. And then I'm just going to go here to this box and copy in the sequences that I've just pasted in, the sequences that I've just copied. Now really, that's all there is to it. Don't want to change any of the settings. I'm just going to hit the Submit button and then wait for my analysis to complete. Sometimes this can take a while, other times you will find in just a few seconds you have your analysis. Now you can see here is the uh, aligned sequences for all six of the organisms that I'm comparing. Every time you see an asterisk, that's a place in the sequence where all six of the organisms have the same DNA nucleotide. So here you see AAA, AAA, all of those are the same. As I scroll down, you can see most of this is pretty similar. That actually makes sense because this is a mitochondrial gene and even though fruit flies are very different from mammals, they use some of the same basic proteins in their mitochondrial processes. Now for my tree, I'm going to go to the tab that says guide tree. And here we see a phylogenetic tree or cladogram showing the relationships among these species. Now we are going to be using the guide tree, not the phylogenetic tree, although there are some technical reasons why the guide tree might not be the best choice. For the purposes of our lab and for display purposes, we're going to be using that tree. Now the easiest way to put this into my paper would be to make a screenshot of the tree. A new file. I can just insert that screenshot and include it as part of my analysis. So there you have it. That's pretty much all it takes to use these two pieces of software. A new file. I can just insert that screenshot and include it as part of my analysis. So there you have it. That's pretty much all it takes to use these two pieces of software. The next step is one that I think will save you a little bit of time. I want you to use the methods section of the student sample articles as the basis for writing your own summary of your specific procedure. 
This way you don't have to come up with everything from scratch. Uh, of course, keep in mind that if you just copy and paste from those sections, you're going to end up including specific information that is not necessarily representative of what you actually did. But this hopefully will help you from having to just start from scratch and rewrite in your own words all of the steps that I've outlined for you in the guidelines. Keep in mind that you're using a software called Clustal Omega, which is not the same software that students have used in the past, so be sure that you're referring to the specific software that we're using for this analysis. Last and probably most importantly, don't allow yourself to be overwhelmed by the technical aspects of the software that's used in this phylogenetic analysis. It's actually a lot easier than it seems because you're not going to be fiddling with the available settings on the websites that you're using. So please reach out to me if you have questions about this. I know this is going to be a challenging assignment, especially one to do at home without me there, but I will be happy to answer any questions that you have by email. And I assure you that I have confidence in you that together we can do this.